<laughs> all right, good evening, everyone. What? That's a good microphone. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. My name is Amali, and I'm the event, on the events team at Books and Magic. Uh, before we get started, I just have a few logistics to point out for how tonight's going to go. First off, we want to give a huge, huge thank you to Wild East Brewing Company for letting us use this fantastic space tonight. Um, we will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end of tonight's discussion, so please start thinking of questions to ask and hold on to them. After the talk tonight, our panelists will be available to sign and personalize books. We also have additional books available to purchase at the table where you checked in. And if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we'd love to encourage you to buy a copy of these authors' books online using the link in the live stream description. So with all that in mind, we're very excited to introduce tonight's writing panel with writers Aly Alyssa Bassist, Sari Bottom, Melissa Lozada Oliva, Kayla Mayuri, Sarah Thunga Matthews, and tonight's moderator, Hannah Bay. <laughs> For those who don't know, Reading is a quarterly series curated and hosted by Michelle Philgate, who is with us tonight both in spirit and virtually on the YouTube live stream, and it is co-sponsored by Literary Hub. Red Ink makes one think of vitality, blood, the monthly cycle, correcting history, and making a mark on the world. Tonight's conversation centers around the theme, avoidance. Alyssa Bassist edits the Funny Woman column on the Rumpus and teaches humor writing at the New School Catapult uh, 92, 92nd, 92 NY, sorry, and White House Writers Workshop. Her first book, Hysterical Memoir, is out September 13th, and we've got pre-pub sales available tonight. Sari Bottom is the author of the memoir and essays, and you may find yourself Confessions of a Late Blooming Gen X Weirdo. She edited the best-selling anthologies Goodbye to All That, Writers on Loving and Leaving New York, and Never Can Say Goodbye, Writers on Their Unshakable Love for New York. She publishes Old Star Magazine, Memoir Monday, and Adventures in Journalism. Melissa Lozada Oliva co-hosts the podcast Say More, and is a member of the band Melly and the Specs. Melissa is the author of Paluda and Dreaming of You. She ho holds an MFA in poetry from NYU, and her writing has been featured in Paper, The Guardian, The Breakbeat Poets, Vulture, Bustle, Glamour, The Poetry Project, BBC Mundo, and, and many more. Kayla Mayuri holds an MFA in fiction from Columbia University. Born in the greater Boston area, she now lives in Brooklyn. Mother in the Dark is her first novel. And last but not least of our writers tonight, we have Sarah Thunga Matthews, whose work has been published in Best American Short Stories, and she's a recipient of fellowships from the Asian American Writers Workshop and the Iowa Writers Workshop. In 2020, she founded the Mutual Aid Group, Beds Die Strong. All This Could Be Different is her first novel. And lastly, we have Hannah Bay, tonight's moderator, who is a journalist and nonfiction writer who is at work on a memoir about family estrangement. She's a 2020 winner of the Rona Jaffe Writers Award and a 2021 and 2022 Peter Taylor Fellow for the Kinder Review Writers Workshops. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's all for me. Without any further delay, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to tonight's panel. Oh, thank you, Molly. Thank you so much to Books Our Magic and to everyone here. It is so wonderful to see this gorgeous crowd and this incredible lineup of authors tonight. Thank you all for coming out. Um, and thank you to Michelle Philgate. She couldn't be here tonight, and it's my honor and privilege to step in for somebody that I call a dear friend and teacher um, who has taught me so much about writing myself. And um, so Michelle conceived of this series to make space for women writers, and I just wanted to explain that it's just a conversation, um, so I won't be requiring our wonderful authors to read, but I will read quotes from each of your books um, while asking questions. And I wanted this to feel very free-flowing, so if somebody, somebody else's question sounds like really inspiring or strikes a chord with you, feel free to chime in. We have four mics among us, so we can pass them back and forth. Um, and I just wanted to explain a little bit about um, the origin of the Reading series. So, the name of this series comes from a Virginia Woolf quote from Mrs. Dalloway. He thought her beautiful, believed her impeccably wise, dreamed of her, wrote poems to her, which, ignoring the subject, she corrected in red ink. 
So I, I love that this quote was Michelle's inspiration for this series, and um, I'm really inspired by the way that she brings together women writers, past and present, um, for these wonderful conversations. So I'm going to start um, with a question for everyone. And so tonight's topic is all about uh, avoidance. So I wanted to hear from all of the authors about you know, what that word means for you as a writer and what it means for your own work. So whoever wants to start, go ahead. <laughs> I'll do it. I want to avoid that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I was diagnosed with OCD. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and a big part of having OCD is avoiding things like your life depends on it because your fear system believes that you're in danger if you don't avoid. And I wrote a lot about that in my book, Hysterical, by Elizabeth Assist, out next Tuesday. <laughs> um, and I wrote about how I got over it doing exposure and response prevention therapy which also helps me get over writer's block because number one, avoiding writing, right? That's the most important thing we should avoid and do avoid. Um, and exposure therapy, if you're lucky enough to ever get to do it, is doing the thing you don't want to do the most in the world and doing it on purpose. And um, that impossible treatment ended up being a big thing that cured not only my writer's block, but a lot of my chronic illness. It's a very long memoir. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's me. <laughs> okay, I need to get that therapy right now. <laughs> um, I somewhat famously have avoided completing my memoir for like decades. <laughs> I finally did it. Um, I was so mostly afraid of exposing people. Um, you know, the people in my life, my family, I had written things in the past that had upset them and it took me a really long time to figure out what was the right balance of blurring people and removing details, but I was so caught up with fear for so long that I found every way to not write my book or write little bits of it but not make the progress that I needed to make and um, Melissa Phoebos' body work really helped me a lot. Um, although I really want to get some exposure therapy now. Um, and I wrote a piece about it for Catapult, uh, for Catapult's Don't Write Alone series, so you can read about that. Um, my memoir is not here tonight. There's one copy. I ran across town to get it. Um, so, but I would love it if people wanted to buy it um, and order it. It's called And You May Find Yourself. But yeah, I avoided it for a long time. Um, I'm also dealing right now with my 82-year-old mother who um, has been avoiding dealing with um, some health issues and it got to a crisis point. So this whole week has been a week of like hospital stuff. Um, and I really relate to that. I remember in my 30s, I would put off, you know, if I felt a pain, if a tooth hurt, I would put it off, and um, you know I wait for when a cavity turned into root canal. Then you don't really have a choice anymore. And I try to use that metaphor in my life, like when I find myself avoiding things, um, especially things that are painful or that I think are going to be painful. I try to say to myself, okay, it's a cavity now. It could become a root canal, which is a lot worse, more painful, and more expensive. So, take it from me. That's the word right there. Is this thing on? Yeah, that's it. Hey, everyone. I'm Sarah. Um, I think for myself, my first acquaintance with the concept of avoidance was like in some, you know, like internet quiz about attachment styles that I probably took at 1.30 in the morning. This might apply to other people in the audience. Um, but in my work and in my fiction, particularly in the novel of mine that came out all of four weeks ago. It's called All This Could Be Different. And it's the story of this young Indian woman named Sneha who moves to a new city, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where she knows nobody and reckons with her first job, her first love, and her first real friends. In that novel, avoidance plays a major role because it lives so profoundly and rootedly in my main character. Um, and 
and the kind of avoidance that I'm most interested in um, exploring in a fictional mode, in a prose mode, is something that the Sari gestured towards right now, which is avoidance of pain, which is a very deeply human thing. Um, and I think that for many of us, many people in the world, IRL, in meat space, but also in the fictional world, in the world of my character, um, you enter into this really difficult paradox where honesty or intimacy early in your life have been really woven through with pain and punishment. Um, I think that's not the most uncommon experience in the world. And so we are built as human beings to try to avoid replicating the most painful past experiences of our life. And so you have an avoided person, like my main character, who goes out of her way again and again to avoid intimacy, to avoid honesty, while also so deeply desiring to be known and to be loved. And I think that that's really an interesting question and the one that, that sustained, one of the questions that sustained me through writing a 300 page book. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Melissa. Okay, I have so much to say in response to everybody. Um, went to the dentist once, <laughs> and she said, dentistry is an expensive but negligences um, but then I'm like what if you don't know how to take care of your teeth um, another thing is I also have OCD brag and um, <laughs> I also did exposure therapy um, which is really torturous the whole thing was like I was afraid that food was poison so I wouldn't eat it so I had to like eat things that looked like they were tampered with in front of my therapist <laughs> um, it was very strange but she said that like thing about OCD is like the more you avoid your fear the bigger it gets so you have to just like look at it and interact with it even, and then it gets smaller and smaller. Um, the last thing I'll say is my professor, um, Terrence Hayes, once said, Melissa, you're very fucking funny, but so is Louis C.K. What are you hiding? <laughs> um, and so in my writing, <laughs> I guess I, I was like making too many jokes and not really getting to the more like serious, complex things that I wanted to, because I was like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> uh, and yeah, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> <that's not fun. laughs> um, so I was really, I went to my MFA program right out of college at 22, and I was very young and definitely avoiding writing the books I wanted to write, which is loosely based on my experience, um, my, my childhood and, and my mother. And I went in with this grandiose novel that I thought was like the, the, you know, what we look at as the American novel written from a male perspective, which I have no idea why I did that. And then um, it, was, it was a terrible novel. And my second semester, I had this professor, Alicia Chappelle, and she said that she was only interested in um, writers who left part of themselves on the page, who left their bloody fingerprints on the page, meaning you had to expose yourself in some way. And another thing that I was afraid to do was expose people that I loved. But if you, you know, if you're not making yourself a victim, then it's okay to do that. Is kind of what I got from that. Um, so I avoided it for years, but then I just dove right into it, um, and it ended up being my novel. Um, so there is another question that Michelle came up with, and it kind of ties with the Virginia Woolf quote that inspired the Reading series' title. Um, so the quote is, you cannot find peace by avoiding life. Michelle actually has this hanging on her office wall, and she only recently found out that this quote has actually been misattributed to Virginia Woolf. Um, it was in the film adaptation of The Hours. <laughs> something that the fictional Virginia Woolf said, um, <laughs> but I thought this quote was really good um, inspiration for this question, which is, what are some ways in which you've learned to confront avoidance or just deal with it? So, anyone who wants to start. <laughs> Confronting avoidance or dealing with it. Wait, Melissa, you had a bad teacher. Oh, Terrence no. Hayes? Terrence Hayes? Yeah. Oh, he was amazing. Oh, oh I'm sorry. He oh. said a bad thing to you. Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, <he was> like, <laughs> I, it haunted me, but also I was like, 
he's kind of right. <laughs> it's just because the world doesn't accept funny women. Yeah, yeah. maybe. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> we yeah. don't have anything to hide if we're being funny. That's men only. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't like that he said that to you. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you can be as funny as you want. Terrence I feel Hayes. like Terrence Hayes is watching the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> Terrence Hayes is over. <laughs> where I kind of acknowledge that I'm avoiding and I give myself a time limit and then I make a list. Lists are my life. I make, every morning I make a list, plus at the beginning of every week I make a list. I've got just lists upon lists. Um, and actually I recently had a viral tweet, um, which then my New Yorker cartoonist friend Carolita Johnson turned into a cartoon which didn't make it into the New Yorker, but it did make it into Oldster magazine. Um, but I had this viral tweet where I said that um, sometimes when I complete a task that wasn't on my to-do list, I, I add it and then check it off for the dopamine boost. Um, and like 117,000 people liked it. Um, but when I make a, there's something about making a list, about breaking down into small steps, the thing that you're avoiding. And sometimes it's about, it seems overwhelming, and sometimes it's about, it seems scary. Um, but if you, so I give myself, I'm like, okay, I have 10 more minutes to be avoidant. And then, you know, the clock is ticking and I'm old, so it's time to, to dive in. And so the listing really, really helps me and the checking off. And I try to break things down into, very granular steps. So I don't know if that's going to help anybody. You're almost described as a Pomodoro. Method. I'm almost described. Well, I do Pomodoro also. That's another thing. For when I'm avoiding writing, I Pomodoro, but I don't only do 25 minutes. I start with five. Um, like when I'm really, really avoiding, it's like, come on, how bad can it be? You'll write for five minutes. What, what's going to happen? You know. And then I do that five minutes, and then I'm like, okay, I could do this. I could do 10 minutes now, and um, at my book launch, my husband taught, heard me talking about the Pomodoro method, and um, usually I use my iPhone, but then he went and he ordered me a tomato timer. So. <laughs> yeah. I have a particular relationship to the avoidance of tasks, which I think of as like quite a different lane than, um, or the avoidance of tasks or the avoidance of work, to me, is just functionally or fundamentally different than like emotional avoidance um, and uh, trying to sort of shy away or complicate or mess up intimacy. And I should be no one's role model. Um, I avoid tasks constantly. But um, I, I do find myself a more functional human being than I used to be around this stuff. And I think that this is basically how I conceptualize it, particularly when it comes to writing and its attendant labors, of which there are many, right? writing as so many of you in the audience or watching online know, is not just about, you know, sitting at the word processor and opening a vein, right? And like letting whatever words spill out. There's invoices, there's forms to be filled, there's just like a hundred fucking things. And the way that I approach it, which is not a recommendation, but it's also what sort of works for me is to accept in honesty who I am, which is a little bit anxious, a little bit of a procrastinator, and to internalize the reality of compound interest a little bit, right? So I tell myself often, if you don't do this now, it will be worse three days from now. You'll have to do more work. You know, you will piss off somebody who is patiently emailing you. And then I tell myself, I can live with that. <laughs> and, um, and then I do it, but I think that it's helpful to sort of have that conversation where a younger version of myself would just like, whoop, 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 don't look, it scares me. Um, I think all, all the time about Joan Didion's essay on self-respect. Um, and one of the things she says is, you know, that real adults have the convictions of their mistakes. And I live that every day. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to, I think, I'm like blanking, I'm avoiding answering the question. <laughs> no. Um, I, I also, okay, so like, the older I get, which is like, I'm 30, which is very old to some people and very young to other people, um, but I just like, I care about 
doing some certain things less and I'm more like, okay, I can prioritize this more. And also like, I don't know, there's this like, <laughs> this sounds, I'm gonna sound like I'm on drugs. There's like a time traveling thing <laughs> where you're like, oh my God, I'm so glad me five minutes ago like decided to do this or I'm so glad me a week ago did this because now me like does not want to do that now. And um, it's just like, I'm always, you have to like think ahead to like, what future you wants and how like life is just gonna be easier if you like clean your space before you wanna write or like do your laundry or like make yourself eat. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so when it comes to writing, I try to just be nice to myself. Like I don't have a word count that I have to meet every day or a certain amount of time I just spend at the laptop. So to not avoid, I'm like, okay, all you have to do is open up the document, take a peek, and look at it, and like make contact with it, and think about it. Because that's half of the process, too, is thinking, and talking, and taking notes, and reading. And so, maybe I'm just teaching you how to avoid more. <laughs> but I think it's not avoiding, because I'm still, it's, it's an active part of my day, is thinking about this project that I'm working on. Yeah. So much of writing isn't writing, either. Yeah. It's like planning, and being in the world and observing and like living a life and then writing later. <laughs> I yeah. feel this very strongly. I feel like a lot of my most sort of punishing years as a young writer were like just treating writing as this wholly professional endeavor, um, which I did out of stress and various kinds of imposter syndrome and being the immigrant daughter of immigrants. Um, and then at some point I was like, bitch, like, we are all out here trying to make art and like sometimes, like frequently, thinking is writing, crying is writing, you know, um, yeah, Pem, the crying is writing is a quote from um, C. Pem Chang, who is a brilliant writer. And so much of writing well comes from living fully and openly and not shielding yourself emotionally from life. Um, allowing yourself to fully immerse yourself in the world you're in and saturate yourself like a sponge in the world you're in and then all of a sudden like you're ready and you go over to the page and then it's squeeze. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. There you go. We're doing the girl thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, well, I was gonna say that like the other the, the other side of the coin with avoidance is this sort of punitive idea, you know, like, oh, you're avoiding, you're bad, you're bad, and, um, and and I think this idea that, you know, writing is so many more things than just sitting with your butt in the chair and writing, um, that if you are kind, I like what you said, that you're, you're kind to yourself, that, um, that when, I, when I think of what I'm doing as avoiding, um, then I'm mad at myself for it. But if I open my mind and think, well, right now I'm living and I'm taking things in, or I or I need a breather. I'm taking a breather, which is part of my process. It's part of the holistic whole thing. There is a Twitter account, and I can never find it when I'm looking for it. I should probably bookmark it the next time I see it. But it's 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 like a Twitter account where it's like um, crying is writing, uh, eating bananas is writing. <laughs> I hate bananas, by the way, but anyway. <laughs> I don't eat them. I agree that doing nothing is very important, and for a long time, I did a lot of nothing, um, and it was because I expected writing to be holy, and I expected to become a celebrity, and that kind of pressure was so paralyzing that I had to avoid the task that would lead to the conclusion of finding out I'm not going to be a celebrity. Um, so sad. Um, <laughs> and then I just had to radically alter and lower my expectations to the lowest possible, where all I wanted to do was like show up and sit down in a chair and like type for one Pomodoro. And that helped me stop avoiding so much, with, is when you make it small and you unholy it and you just make it. Um, insignificant like the stakes could not possibly be lower that's the only way I can get anything done like this this isn't gonna make or break me um, and not having these expectations of myself to be anything other than someone who just like reaches the next inhale that's like how I got out of depression 
that's how I got out of dealing, I, that's how I am dealing with OCD. It's how I started writing, dating, living, loving, breathing. Um, <laughs> and I always find now, like, the thing I want to avoid is the thing I must do right now. Um, so that I don't let the anxiety build and build and build, because that's what I'm avoiding is that that anxiety that I'm only building by avoiding. Because I actually usually like to do the thing I don't want to do. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to just add, like, lowering expectations is something I try to do for myself all the time. Like, to the point of, like, so maybe I just won't have a book. What, how, would, how bad would my life be if I didn't do that? You know, and, and so lowering expectations is just... Highly recommend it. Yeah. yeah, I really love the the common thread of making writing more gentler, um, and and really using the page to be more loving toward ourselves. Um, that's something that I am really learning firsthand as a writer. Um, so this next round of questions is geared toward the individual authors. Um, but again, if you hear something in another author's response or in the question that you know, connects with you, please chime in. Um, so I'm going to start with Sarah. So Sarah, and all this could be different, Sneha, your main character, is ashamed of her personal history. So you write, despite some degree of aversion to self-pity, I had longed, walking across the blue carpeted airport, watching hordes of cheerful seeming people, greeting loved ones with unfeigned warmth, to have been born a slightly different person subtract my uncle from my life, subtract my father's deportation, subtract the coldness and dislocation that appeared to run through my personality like electric wiring ran through a house. All this, the very facts of who I was, could be different. I could be a person refigured, warm, charming, loving, loved. Why does Sneha want to avoid her past? Because her past is very painful. And I, I mean, I think I'm not really super interested in, right at this moment, sort of laying out a laundry list of sort of causal um, psychological motivations for the way, um, for the way she is. Um, partly just because I, I don't believe that things are that one-to-one -one for any of us. I think that this is, Snea is a young person who's experienced like multiple traumatic events as have many of us. She also has a whole self that is in conversation with both the past trauma, but also the past love, with the, the present moment of our life. And what this passage that Hannah just read out, I think fundamentally engages with is that she wants to be different. And I think, that, I think of that as something that I was more interested in, like the, the question of the future than the question of the past in this book. I think the past in so many ways serves as prologue, it helps us understand, it helps us situate. Um, the novel is political in various ways and so there are, you know, a, a large chunk of it is interested politically in a sort of prologue at the present moment. It's set in 2013. But um, there's also this mirroring that happens with the main character where from the first page, I think that there's this gesture she makes towards us, the readers, where she offers up a little bit and then pulls it back. And then she offers up a little bit and then pulls it back. And that sort of movement was what, what I was much more interested in than sort of um, the plain facts of a trauma, which I feel like, frankly, we are bombarded with day after day with in current events in our own excavations of self. Um, and at times, I've, in, in my own life, but also in fiction, I sometimes ask myself the question, well, if you boil everything down, if you boil all the seawater down, the salt that remains of this trauma, well, what does that actually give you? Um, so maybe it's an unsatisfying answer, but um, that's, that's how I thought about it, really, this um, usage of shame that signals possibility and a chance of escape, a chance of transcendence of self, and frankly, a reconfiguration of the bonds that we form as people that create society. I love that response, and I love how expansive it is. Thank you, Sarah. 
Thank you. Yeah, so my next question is for Sari. In your memoir, And You May Find Yourself, Confessions of a Late Blooming Gen X Weirdo, which I highly recommend everyone <laughs> order, um, you have an essay called Mean Girls, and you write, in the end, after spending too much of my life pretending in order to please people, I'd rather be honest and suffer the consequences than act fake to get along. If that makes people think I'm weird and ostracize me, so be it. In my late 50s, I can take it. What did it take to get you to that point to you know, really be more fully yourself? Because I really admire that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm talking a good game there. I mean, I definitely, <laughs> it still hurts, you know, when people um, think I'm weird or, or that I've said the wrong thing. Um, but I definitely have suffered enough um, from not speaking up, from trying to go along and get along, that I've, I've had enough bad experiences of that um, of making myself small, um, that I just couldn't take it anymore. You know, I just reached a point where I couldn't take it. And I also realized that a lot of the people who were judging me, rejecting me, weren't really people I admired. You know, I guess it was a bit of maturity on my part. Um, you know, the ways that I used to contort myself to get along with people, have people like me, um, it's, it's comical. and. That's the funny part of my book, <laughs> some of the things that I used to do to make people like me. But um, yeah, you reach a point where you just can't do that anymore. Self-abandonment starts to just feel impossible if, if you do it enough. Um, and it's funny, I guess earlier we were talking about a misattributed um, uh, Joan Didion quote. I have a misattributed uh, quote on my arm. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, everybody thinks it's Anais Nin or Anais Nin, however you pronounce it. Um, and the day came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom, which is really what you're talking about, what, I'm, what my life is about, what my life has become about, is about like having the courage to be real and, and, and fully myself instead of shrinking myself into a bud. But it is not. It is a quote from a, um, a woman who was a publicist for a, an adult ed college in California in the 70s. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, she, yeah, yeah, she's, she's um, I meant, I have a story in the book about that too. Um, but anyway, um, it's, when there come, the re you reach a point after you've been diminishing yourself uh, for so long where you just can't do that to yourself anymore. And I think that's exactly why your book meant so much to me as a reader because I wanted that life experience of somebody who has that wisdom, you know? And, and so I really thank you for that, Sari. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for reading my book. Of course. I left an effusive Goodreads review. I'll do that for everyone. <laughs> you sure did. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone should do that. Everyone, for every single person on this panel and all the authors in the audience as well. Um, so my next question is for Kayla. Kayla, in your memoir, Angel Dust, 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 Angel Kayla, in Mother in the Dark, your main character, Anna, grapples with her mother's mental illness. You write, all around us, the blackened windows reflected the lighted rooms of our house, eclipsing the outside world. I avoided our reflections, the distorted, faceless figures seated at the table, disturbed by the way we morphed into sameness. I didn't want to be related to this creature, this imposter who'd come to stay. Can you tell us about you know, why coping, why avoidance is a coping mechanism for Anna? Yeah, it's like, it's funny because this theme is like spot on for my book, <laughs> right from page one. Um, so, I mean, a couple of things. She's avoiding her mother because she has anxiety looking at her past and confronting things that members of her family did and also that she did. Like she doesn't, a big part of the novel is that her mother, her sister calls saying that something has happened, she needs to return home and Anna won't return that call. Um, because she, I think also is afraid of confronting the fact that she left her family in a really abrupt sort of not nice way. Um, but also the avoidance is because, I mean that passage, um, 
kind of says that she feels so much shame because she sees herself as an extension of her mother and all of these unlikable parts of herself she sees in herself and it's just easier to be in New York away from Boston and ignore that but the irony is that the more she avoids her mother she sees you know the specter of her mother haunts her on the streets and she thinks that she sees her in cafes and also she is um, repeating the same behaviors, wallowing in self-pity and being really self-sabotaging. So she's trying to make it work as a coping mechanism, but it's, of course, not working. And you render it so beautifully. I, I, after reading this quote, I was like, oh my god, I need to read this book. So I'm so, so excited. And congratulations. <laughs> so my next question is for Melissa. So you have this incredible novel and verse, Dreaming of You. And in your book, there's a part called Who's That Girl? And you write, one morning I look up at the mirror from washing my face and it's like my face is scrolling upward, like someone else's thumb is pushing it there. I try to hold it down. So those lines, they really capture what it feels like to not be seen by others or by yourself. Um, but then Michelle also read an interview with you in the Creative Independent where you said of being an artist, it's like this weird double entendre, because it's like, I really want to be seen, but what happens if someone's looking too closely? Do you think that there's an aspect of avoidance that's kind of inherent to performance? Um, oh yeah, definitely. I think, I think a lot of people only feel themselves when they're performing, but it's also this like fabricated, it's like you can only feel yourself if you're being seen. Um, and I think I've definitely felt that way before um, and was trying to tap into that with dreaming of you and like what it means to have like fandom and what it means to like love a celebrity so much even though you've never met a celebrity the celebrity before um, and all these things that you're like flinging at somebody who you simply don't know um, and I think I, I said this, okay, so I, a lot of the book is based on this, like, conceit that someone told me once that was, I mean, who knows if it rings true to anybody else, but, like, if you don't raise your kids with religion, they'll find it in a person or a band, and I think that's really funny, and I think, like, people for some, for whatever reason, like, need something to, like, worship, um, and feel, people need to feel, like, very, very small, like, help you still feel small when you stand beside the ocean, like, I think, like, that is, like, whatever, whatever feeling that invokes is, like, really human, um, and I told this to someone, like, two weeks ago, and she was like, I don't know, I think God is myself. And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, whatever. <I> would, <laughs> and then, uh, she was like, you sound lost. And I was like, I am. <laughs> anyway, so I, I think that, yeah. <laughs> was she recruiting for followers? Or what? I know. No, she just uh, was 22 years old. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, and I was like, whatever. <laughs> Man, that hubris of youth. I mean, I feel like there's performance in, like, everyone's work. I mean, as writers, when you launch your book, you're expected to perform and read your work. And then I know a lot of you teach and speak and perform, um, you know, in such admirable ways. So does anyone else have any thoughts on, like, performance in avo avoidance and performance? I think that, like, I, I'm sort of been teasing apart an idea um, or like a, 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 a concept while we've been talking, and it's this idea that avoidance can be useful, right? I think it's framed in, like in an almost pathologizing way, um, but I think that the real the real danger of avoidance is when it goes too far, right? When it causes harm, when it sort of a lot of us have sort of talked about avoidance on a like you know, invoking temporality, right? Like, it's it's probably fine to avoid something for a couple of days, less good to avoid something or a person or a difficult conversation or your book for years. Um, and I think that um, sometimes a limited avoidance of something can be, can have profound utility. It can give you 
space to know what it is you think. It can, you know, help you if you're someone like me who compartmentalizes and tells, you know, tells yourself, okay, you're not allowed to be nervous for two hours and then this event will be over and you can like take a big deep breath. But that shit is useful. Yeah. And that goes back to this idea of performance. I think for me, so much of performance is about sectioning off parts of myself and my brain and my like fragile, dumb little heart and being like, okay, you go here for now and like you can go back and get it after a certain period of time. The danger is when that period of time extends and extends and extends. Yeah, it's really, it's like a trauma response as you were saying, like it's your brain and body taking care of you until you can take care of you. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think I, I think I was also for much of my life performing a different versions of myself in avoiding who I really was because I didn't think that people would like me um, and so I was like pretending performing and, and it was its own avoidance um, of reality so thank you so much everyone um, so Alyssa we're on to your question from hysterical your memoir that comes out on Tuesday that everyone Everyone here is lucky enough to be able to purchase in advance, if you so choose, and I hope you do. Um, so you write in the introduction of your fantastic new memoir, My silence hurt me more than anything I could ever say. And it wasn't only that I thought I was going to die when I was sick, I was pretty sure I was going to die, but that I thought I was going to die with so much unsaid. How is silence one of the most pervasive and toxic forms of avoidance? Girl. <laughs> uh, talking about long periods of avoidance and how that's bad, mine was about 10 years where I just stopped. I was like, no. Um, and I started stopping with performing, um, which I love to do, but I didn't like what I did to myself after, which was mentally review every single thing I said, judge everything I said on a scale of 1 to 10, it was always minus 10, um, and beat myself up for every imperfection. And to stop doing that to myself, I just stopped putting myself out there, thinking that that's how I would find peace. And I did find peace, but I also found every other feeling imaginable and made myself sick from my silence because it was obsessive and compulsive. And what was the question? How is silence one of the most pervasive and toxic forms? Yeah, mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's so easy to say and do nothing at a certain point, especially when that's what the world wants from you and um, you're rewarded for making yourself so small because you're not punished for making yourself big. Like, and that's um, what I was always confronting. Um, and that's why I didn't like what that man said to you. <laughs> because to me, that's just another form of silencing, like telling you what not to do. Um, I'm sure he had the best of intentions, but I just, I just collected so much of that from really well-meaning men my whole life who were like superstars who could silence me in a comment like that and like after 10,000 of them just being quiet was the safest bet and, um, and it made me unalive, not only like deathly ill but I just stopped being a person and I was doing it in an effort to be safe and to make everyone else happy because it seemed that's what they wanted. And to be the ideal woman was to be a silent woman is what I um, came to after trying to be like the ideal woman who could do 69 different sex positions, the um, ideal woman who, that's it. There was two. <laughs> After finding out I was barren, I wasn't going to be that kind of a woman. I didn't find out I was barren, I decided I was barren. It was my choice. Um, so, yeah, so that silence and that avoidance was, uh, I mean, again, as I said, and as I write, it made me physically ill. Um, 
And there are studies on this that the women who repress end up getting cancer like three times as much as women who express their anger in particular. Um, I also was not able to advocate for myself in front of doctors. So I couldn't advocate for my health literally because I had so lost my voice. I couldn't say no to men because that's such an unattractive word. Um, and I just totally imperiled my sense of self, my, my actual safety, even though it felt safe to be silent. Um, and everything that feels good about being alive, I gave up so that I wouldn't come off as rude impolite, aggressive, mean, stupid, um, you know, every word that's applied to, wo to a woman just for being a woman. Um, so yeah, silent sucks, don't do it. <laughs> Alyssa, it just occurs to me that you wrote a piece uh, when I was at Longreads that I edited, and I think it's called Speak Again? Yeah. Yeah. It's Shakespeare. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Shakespeare said that. King Lear. Those two words, speak again. Yeah, that became my mantra. He actually said it to his daughter, saying, like, speak again highly about me, and I'll give you money and favor. <laughs> Caitlin, did you give me that title? No. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how I got it. <laughs> yeah, speak again. I mean, that's what I learned in OCD therapy. Um, it's risk. Risk coming off as rude, risk coming off as bossy, risk coming off as unlikable, risk coming off as annoying, aggravating, um, bitchy, nasty, uh, all, all of the negative words, um, so that you can say what it is you're thinking and um, who say what it is you're thinking without it being dependent on like the listener. Because I was always speaking so that someone would like what I was saying, which isn't really authentic speech. And, um, and I would like speak and shut up. That was like my whole thing. I'm rather familiar with this concept. Yeah, <laughs> we have a lot of comment. I, I feel like everyone. I imagine everybody in this room. Yeah. yeah. Something that um, I think about when it comes to silence is like the, um, the way it embodies for me this like like combination of refusal and safety, right? Which gestures uh, to what you were just saying, Melissa. And um, I think that, but like both in the fictional character that I wrote, uh, that I wrote, and also a part, a past version of me, like I took a great deal of refuge in silence. I came to this country in my late teens as an immigrant. Um, there were all these ways in which. Um, Speaking and um, moving in the world seemed really attendant with punishment and embarrassment, and that wasn't my neurosis. Let me be pristinely clear. Um, it really was the people around me, you know, just being who they were, being well-meaning but thoughtless. Um, and I was very quiet for a long period, and um, I think that one of the things that seems useful to me as a metaphor about this time was um, right after I immigrated. I grew up in a very particular way, um, and one of the things that was just factual about the way I grew up was that I'd never crossed a street by myself um, until after I immigrated. And um, the country I grew up in had, you know, just like, like now it definitely has pedestrian crossings, etc., but it didn't have the time. And so I had truly just never had the experience of crossing, especially a busy street, before without an adult, typically a man, like literally holding my hand. And I remembered being a teenager and ha in winter and having to cross the street by myself and feeling insane fear because I just had not done this thing before. And I knew that I had a little white man blinking at me and a countdown and I was like, but I don't know how fast I walk. And so I waited in Midwestern winter, you know, like just like cycle after cycle after cycle of delay. And I was like, I'm too fucking cold. And I just like bolted across the street. And I think that that's for me a particular metaphor that's functional and useful around silence, um, where it's like after a certain point, you do become unalive. 
at a certain point you freeze to death, you know? Um, you have to run, you have to cross the street, you have to engage with a fact of being human, which is that we want to connect, but more importantly, that life is full of pain. Most of it we cannot avoid, but some of the pain that we can choose to not invite into our lives is the, very, is the pain of avoidance, the pain created by trying to sidestep every kind of exposure and intimacy and conflict. Thank you, Sarah. And really, each and every one of you have done something so brave by you know, putting your full selves out on the page and being your full, funny, brilliant, courageous self. So I really applaud each of you. I wanted to open it up to questions. Um, folks, feel free to raise your hands. Um, we've got about 10 minutes to, to hear from all of you. We're Don't be shy. Avoid. Don't avoid. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can just go ahead and start with oh I see one. Uh, this doesn't have to do with the theme though. It's okay. <laughs> I was wondering what each of you what is your favorite thing about your own writing? So the question is what is your favorite thing about uh, your own writing? This is violent. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's lovely. It's lovely. I'm, I'm just joking. Um, I think I write the most and best rape jokes. <laughs> I know how to do it. Wow. I hope someone, I really pray that someone reviews my book and says, most best rape jokes in a book <laughs> or any medium. <laughs> All right, I'm going to do it. Please do. If nobody else does, I'll do it for you. Um, one of my favorite kinds of essays to receive as an editor are ones where people take a difficult topic and turn it at an angle through and look at it through an absurd lens and maybe it comes out funny. Like there have been a few pieces over the years that I've never forgotten that I've edited um, where someone took, like there's this one piece called um, Grief is a Jumble Word written by a man named Ken Otterberg and um, he is grieving his wife who died of cancer and the piece is just like I woke up in the morning and I was sad, and then I made breakfast and I was sad, and then I walked the dog and I was sad. And he's looking at the absurdity of something really hard, and so at the same time, he moves you, but also makes you laugh. And I, I think I do that. Um, yesterday, my mother was in the hospital, and I had to wait a while before going to see her, and I pulled my book out of her drawer, and I was cracking up. <laughs> I made myself laugh, but it was, I was also reading like really, really sad stuff that I've been through. So, um, and my, my sister-in-law sent me a text like, I'm so sorry for all that you've been through. I was like, no, it's funny. It's funny. You know, I mean, yeah, it was sad. It sucked while it happened, but it's funny. So anyway, I make myself laugh. It is such a really unexpected pleasure for me on this subject is like, uh, has been getting told by people that they found parts of the book I wrote funny or yeah, that they laughed out loud. I didn't know the degree to which like there was like some like hungering part of me that just like really wanted to be told that I could be funny, but it exists, she's out here. Um, my favorite my favorite thing um, I mean, about my writing is um, when it's good, I think it's sort of like dense and mirrored, like you, it kind of uses the like kind of like found material of the scenes and pages that came before to kind of like keep creating new language and that's something that I like to read and so I'm glad that I read it, I guess. Um, and it's sort of chewy and varied and I like reading stuff like that so I'm, gl I'm glad that I figured out a way to write like that. Um, I'm gonna say a similar thing, I think maybe because it's a panel full of women were like, yeah, it's kind of cool that we're funny. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I, I think something that I do, I'm like happy that I know how to do is, is like connect humor and sadness together and like the instinct of someone to like crack a joke when something is really upsetting um, and like why that is, like why that goes hand in hand and I think like growing up, I really liked Nick Hornby for that reason because I thought he did that really. I think he does that really well. Um, so that's always 
always like trying to whenever like the the dance of humor and sadness is very like delicate it, and my writing I'm like all right I killed it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely not funny, <laughs> but I think I'm good at writing like dark, heavy, emotional stuff without being overly sentimental. Hopefully, maybe. <laughs> I love that. Any other questions? It doesn't have to be about avoidance. It could be about anything. Like, what are our authors reading? What, what do they love? Like, so feel free to ask anything. Yes. What's the hardest part about writing books? <laughs> What's the hardest part about writing a book All for you? <laughs> it's an endurance test. Yeah, it's, it's definitely an endurance test, like, and, and sometimes when you're at the beginning of doing it, and you're like, oh my god, I have so much more to write, and then I have to rewrite it, um, but I do remember many, 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 many years ago, um, someone tweeted, did you know that if you write 500 words a day for 100 days, you get 50,000 words a <laughs> um, and, and it made me think like, oh, it's an endurance test, but just like everything else that's an endurance test, if you just break it down. Um, but that is the hardest part, I think, for me. It was, well, that and like being afraid that people are going to be mad at me. For me, it's getting out of my own way and getting over myself and um, just leaning into maybe I wrote something bad, embarrassing, stupid, um, and moving forward and not letting myself get hung up on the fear that it's bad and the like I always write with like these um, particular people in mind who are like that sentence sucks you're an idiot you should be embarrassed go die um, and like re um, shutting those voices up and just being like, yeah, maybe it's bad, and then just going forward, and then also trying to imagine fans reading it as opposed to critics, because the critics, they just stop me every word I put down, but if I imagine someone I love who loves me, like you, <laughs> <laughs> reading it, then, I, then it feels so much better, and then I'm out of my own way. So, writing tip. I think the hardest part is just, like, the beginning like generative like my roommate was like it was crazy you just made all this shit up but like <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is all like coming from a, like one brain and that's like really really hard to just make up people who don't exist and make them do things that never happened um and that is really really hard and but and it's like it's literally torture like i don't why do we do this <laughs> but um and then after, like, editing for me is fun, because you're like, oh, I can, like, put something in here, but it's, like, the beginning that is the worst for me. <laughs> I love revising. I could do it for years and years. I hate writing. <laughs> I need it. Um, but I think the problem for me is that I really just, like, even after writing a book, I still don't know how to write plot. And, like, with the second book, I still don't think there's much plot happening. But I, like... I'm so happy to fill up a notebook by hand just with images of the characters eating and talking and laughing and being mean to each other and nothing, I mean, there's purpose to it, but it's not. I love that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I mean, a lot. Lots of, lots of love that. I think the hardest thing for me is the sustained belief that the book matters, that the ideas within it matter, the, the questions that generate and power it matter, and like ultimately both these things are a front for like the fear that I don't matter and nothing that I have is worth listening to. And so I think sort of um, guarding against that fear, and the only, you know, I have written, I've worked on one novel for seven years and then put it away and tried, uh, you know, decorous tier or two, but it's much more than a cry decorous tier. And then I wrote the book I wrote in 2020, you know, desperately, like, just, like, like feeling like I was, like, running, you know, the race of my life. Um, 
And I think that sense of momentum felt important to me in order to not get into what had entrapped me before, which was this fear of, I don't matter, nothing I have to say is like worth any, you know, anyone listening to, let alone paying, you know, like $25 in hardback for. So our last question is, what does success look like for you on a daily basis? I love myself when I show up, sit down, write one good sentence, and survive the day. That's it. And I, in that one good sentence moment, I just like celebrate the shit out of it. I'm self-high-fiving, it's a five minute dance party. Um, I just revel in that one good sentence. And then everything else can be bad, but I feel great. And you just have to have one good sentence every day for 17 years in order to have <laughs> Wow, 17 years. Um, for me, it's similar, but it's more like, and this relates to the theme, if I have pushed past my resistance and avoidance and created anything that feels good, whether it's a passage or a paragraph, um, it, but, but part of that is that I pushed past my avoidance. I, I, I fought myself and I got something good down, um, no matter what size it is. That's a good day for me. You already have me. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to figure this out too. Um, I think that I used to have definitions that were like 300 or 400 words a day or bust, and more days than not, I would not get to anywhere close to that. Um, number, despite trying very hard, what sucks, you know, it would be one thing if I didn't try and didn't make the time, um, but I often tried and it didn't work out, and I think, especially after writing this manuscript and um, having a really turbulent last few years in my life, you know, both beautiful but also difficult ways, I, like Kayla, have chosen to try to become more gentle with myself. And the way I think about success on a day-to-day -day basis, which is a beautiful question and a frame now for me, is I want to feel a sense of advancement, even if it's around thinking or reading. Sometimes I don't work on a particular project, but I think about a project, and I, if I have a good thinking day, a good thought, <laughs> um, I count the day as a success, and I really define my success, the successful day, by this question of do I feel healthy? Do I feel like I'm living well? Did I eat okay? Did I talk to someone who loves me? Um, yeah, I think it, I feel like it, it depends day to day. Sometimes like it'll be a word count or like a plot development that I didn't realize needed to happen or like a reason a character doesn't like their mom. And then sometimes it's just someone being like, like either editor, agent, or friend being like, good job. Like, that was really nice. Yeah. <laughs> Affirmation. <laughs> um, I'm actively avoiding my second novel right now. And like you said, Sarah, just, I'm just so happy if I open up the file and look at it and think about it. Because I, otherwise, I do feel so much shame. So I'm nice to myself. I don't have to add anything to it, but just trying to be thoughtful with it. I interviewed Cheryl Strayed once, thank you, for uh, <laughs> Creative Nonfiction magazine, and she said, um, like, success is a pile of shit that someone stacked up real high. And I, it's, that, that was a paraphrase of her beautiful quotation. Um, and I, that just really stuck with me because I think we have, like, a really distorted view of success. And I like that we all like focused on small moments because we probably realized that those big moments are few and far between and misleading and bullshit. Um, so I think it really is like a moment of eating. Like uh, instead of, I, I was like, I must die in service of my book. Like it's, if it's me or the book, the book lives. Um, and I would like sacrifice just 
eating, taking care of myself, and that is just not how anything gets written. Um, and learning to prioritize your mental health, your physical health, um, and celebrating these like small moments are just life-saving, because it's such a mental game, and you have to be on top of that mental game at all times. And it's the hardest game. <laughs> so, so true. Well, thank you everyone for being such a wonderful, attentive audience. It's been such a pleasure. Congratulations to our incredible authors, Kayla Mayuri, <laughs> Melissa Lozada Oliva, Sarah Thumpton Matthews, Sari Botten, and Alyssa Basis. Thank you to Books on Magic and to Wild East Brewing, and I hope you'll support these incredible authors and get your books signed. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. I'm back up here and say that my coworker H and I are going to be around for another 20 minutes or so. So if you want to buy copies of the book, please head out there to do it. The space is open until 10, so you're welcome to hang around, get another beer, tip your bartenders, and just have a great time with these wonderful writers. That's all. Thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you.